Hey there, people. It's your TV pal, Nick, here, and it is time for the next segment in my Top 100 of 2015, or Top 100 Games 2015 edition. It's weird to say that because sometimes it makes it sound like these are the Top 100 Games from 2015. Well, no. We'll have my Top 10 Games of 2015 coming out very soon, but these are the 100 Games overall, as of like a couple of months ago when I compiled the list, that are the games that I love the most right now. Like, if you had to say, like, Nick, choose 100 games, this is it. You, you know, the rest of them are getting tossed into a shredder and then fed to orphans. Uh, then I would say these are the 100 games that I will absolutely, under no circumstances, let those orphans devour. I'm on an orphan kick for some reason. Okay, so let's get into it. Of course, we're going to have the second opinions from the Board Game Geek crew, which are always appreciated. At least I always appreciate them. Um, if you disapprove, then certainly we'll go ahead and burn that website down to the ground, but as a last resort. So let's get right into it with number 40 to 31. My number 40 was on last year's list. It's actually down 18 spots from number 22, and I'm not sure why that is. There was an expansion that came out this year that I liked quite a bit, um, although I can't actually use it all the time unless I borrow a copy of the main game from one of my friends, and that should be enough hints for you right there. But number 40 is Takenoko from Asmodee and Bombix, and the thing is, I have the large collector's edition. I don't know that you can see it. It might be off camera up here, but uh, the expansion chibis that came out this year which is great they don't have for the collector's edition yet it's, it's, it's not compatible the card size is a difference and and things like that the tiles that come in that are different so i'm kind of stuck unless i if i can only play it if i borrow another copy from one of my friends but nevertheless takanoko is a great game it's a gateway game that looks beautiful and even if you get the normal version of takanoko it has amazing components where you are trying to manipulate a gardener and a panda in this bamboo garden you have to put out new bamboo plots you try to grow bamboo with these really cool little wooden pieces uh to actually stack up so it the game looks incredible when you walk by it and see some other people playing it or when you play it yourself just as you see everything unfold onto the table it's great and it, and it plays very very well it's very simple it's not the most uh it's definitely not one of the heaviest games but because of its simplicity because it's easy to teach and because it plays very quickly it's been a huge hit in my group especially with new players who just love the spectacle and the idea of it the theme is actually stronger than you would suspect it feels abstract at times but then the, ba the panda eating bamboo and the gardeners making the bamboo grow is a really cool concept. And I just love the sort of hand management of the uh, having the different achievements in your hand and trying to meet those in order to get points. So I love the game. The expansion is great. I hope they upgrade it with a collector's edition and maybe that will bump this back up the list to its proper place. That is Takenoko from Asmodee and Bombix, my number 40. But Mer Merck's, Merck's Rats says, I was never invested in the game and I never tried to interact with the other players. Somehow I won without even trying. Sitting in a room and watching The Incredibles with a three-year-old was far more enjoyable. I probably can't disagree with that, actually. My number 39 is brand new to the list. This is a spiritual successor to the game Lewis and Clark, which is not on my list because despite recognizing Lewis and Clark as a very good game... It just wasn't for me. It felt a little bit too dry. But Discoveries, its successor, worked much, much better for me and for my group because this one is actually a dice placement game in a sense. Uh, it, they're both both games have the same theme. You're leading the troop of explorers uh, led by Lewis and Clark across the American frontier, getting help from Native Americans along the way and trying to, in this case, Use your dice representing different symbols to both uh, gain the aid of these Native American tribes, but also to progress through the different stages of your journey. There's a bunch of cards out that have different um, conditions for you to pass through them, and you have to try to get mountain symbols and river symbols to pass through the different areas of the land, gaining you victory points, gaining you some symbols, which might lead to more victory points through like a set collection type aspect and so on. It's really cool when you get the different special powers of the Native American tribes, and the game looks beautiful. It's got that artwork from Vincent Dutrait, which is just mwah, amazing. He's one of the best artists in board gaming around today, possibly one possibly the best i'm not quite sure there's quite a few artists i love a bit but uh the whole game looks great plays great very smooth and the theme is somewhat there strong enough for me at least to keep me interested and invested of going through this journey and getting the help of these different people so that is discoveries my number 39 brand new to the list but i loved it so much it had to move up this far from asmodee and 
uh, I can't remember the other company. But Kurtz, or Kurtz, or Kurt says, simple rules, but still looking for the game and the fun. Again, people saying, not a game. Gotta have a bell for when that happens. My number 38 is a game I am convinced at this point I am one of the only reviewers that actually likes it, or will at least admit to liking it. I don't know why I love this game. I don't understand the hatred that it gets, but that is High Command, either War Machine or Horde's High Command from Privateer Press. This is Privateer's uh, idea of a deck-building game set in their War Mahords universe, the, uh, the Iron Kingdoms, which is the basis of their miniatures games primarily, but also their RPG games as well, video games, and so on and so forth. This is actually down five spots from number 33, which is not a huge drop. I still love the game. There's been some expansions that have come out in the past year. I think since I did my list last year, the Big Box Faith and Glory expansion came out, which is great. More factions, more ideas. And look, I understand some of the problems with the game. Tiny text, not colorblind friendly. I think they might have remedied that in the last couple of sets with better icons to identify different card factions. Um, But I love the artwork. I love the idea. I love the theme. I love the deck building. I love the idea that you each have your own personal deck that you can construct ahead of time. Uh, which is a great idea to make your own personal buy pile of things, aside from the cards that you start off with in typical deck building fashion, which means you are completely different than all the other players and what they do. It's not like you're buying from a common pool, which means eventually you're all just going to be sanitized into like whoever can get the best cards the fastest. It's whatever cards are best from your deck you're trying to get. And then it's even more thematic because... You not only are building up your faction, but you're taking those faction cards and trying to take over different locations like a tactical miniatures game. I love it. It's great. I don't know why it doesn't get more respect, but I certainly wish that it would. And I think it's selling well enough, apparently. Maybe it's the uh, the Warma Hordes faithful who have crossed party uh, lines or um, uh, hobby lines in order to buy into the game as well together with the miniatures game. But even so, I don't even play the miniatures game. And I love High Command, whether it's War Machine or Hordes. I think they're both great. That is my number 38. I will never give up the fight. Uh, so with, however, did give up the fight right away. Far better things in gaming to enjoy than another derivative deck builder. We had a worker placement in the 2000s. Welcome to the spate of deck building in the 2010s. My number 37 is brand new to the list and is from a designer who I feel is one of the best up and coming designers, meaning that he's one to look out for because he's going to be doing some amazing things and has already done some amazing things as evidenced by this game Spectre Ops from Plat Hat Games and uh, co-published with Nazca Games, which is designer Emerson Matsuchi. This is brand new to the list, but it's a fantastic game. This is a one versus all hidden movement game. One player is the hunt, I think it's Hunter. In this game, I've played so many of these types of games, I forget what the titles of these characters, but a hunter, or no, the hunters are the people trying to catch the runner. That's what it is. The runner is trying to uh, break into this top secret facility and with all of his special gadgetry, and there's different characters you can take control of as, but uh, you're, you're moving around secretly using a pad and paper to record your movements out on the map. The other players are hunters who like a wolf man and a, cy- a robot cyborg thing, um, and you're trying to find the the runner by spreading out, searching different areas. You have different special abilities to help this, like the wolf character, the werewolf, can uh, like smell the area and run really fast to try and find these people. And it's super tense. You're, the runner's trying to run around, meet these different objectives, and uh, it, it looks fantastic. The, the artwork is great. The board looks really great and high quality. It's got really cool miniatures as well. And I don't know. The game has just been a huge hit with my group as well. Everyone who I've played it with has loved it. Well, most people I've played it with have loved it. I love the tension. I love playing either side. It plays best with three players, I believe, maybe four. When you get up to, I think, five being the cap, um, you have like a hidden traitor element. Uh, Like one of the hunters is actually on the runner side, which is a great idea. It doesn't really pan out that well. But even so, it's still great at that point. And it's, it's just a fantastic game, and I hope it gets more expansions. I hope that this is... I love this trend of re- revitalizing this genre of games, which I think is a fantastic genre, the one versus all hidden movement game. It's just great to feel like um, you're different and distinct from all the rest of the players and you're doing your own thing. I don't know. That's, that's a whole other rant I can get off on, but that is Spectre Ops from Plaid Hat Games and Nazca Games, my number 37. Phil Trees disagrees with all that and says that all that for a buzz, uh, all that buzz for a game about, all that for a buzz, all that buzz for a game about hide and go seek, really? 
bypass this. You have been warned. My number 36 is the last uh, new game from this segment of the list. I think we only have three on this segment. And that is Shakespeare from Istari and Asmodee. This is a fantastic Euro game. And like I said before, there's not a ton of Euro games on my list. So when there are Euro games, it's like, wow, that must be really good. Or at the very least, it's a game that appeals to someone like me who likes more thematic experiences. And there is a strong theme in Shakespeare. You are trying to... uh, have your theater company put on the best performance possible by manipulating all of these different actors, putting them in different costumes, uh, set designers, wardrobe designers, um, different patrons of the arts. You have to manipulate all these people, which sounds really bad, actually, but <laughs> to try and move yourself up on these different act tracks and prepare yourself for these final performances. You have uh, dress rehearsals, and uh, you have to make sure that your, uh, your building even looks as good as possible, or else you're going to be taking negative points. And that's the thing. This game is very tense. It's very tight. There is no margin for error. Every game in this I've played has been close. And whenever I have failed in the game, I could say, okay, I can go back clearly and see where I screwed up. If I had done this differently, or if one of the other players had tripped up just a little bit more, I would be ahead. That's how tense the game is. And sometimes that doesn't work out very well. But for Shakespeare, it works great. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. I love the artwork. And I have always wanted to play it again immediately after I finish a game of it. That's how great it is in my collection. That is Shakespeare from Astari in Asmodee, brand new to the list. Shadowbind, despite having a cool name, disagrees with me. A mild annoyance is how the game finds ways to penalize players, despite it already being considerably difficult to advance in the the various tracks. This is an adequate design, but to paraphrase the bard himself, we have seen better games. I don't even know what that's a paraphrase of, but I'm no Shakespeare expert. My number 35 was on last year's list. It's actually down 17 spots from number 18, and I think that's only because I played the game a lot when it first came out and kind of gave it a rest for a while, although I just played and reviewed an expansion that would probably have bumped it up a bit had I played it before I made this list, and that is Abyss from Asmodee and Bombix, another game from Asmodee and Bombix, like a Takenoko. Abyss got the most attention when it came out because of its artwork, which is stunning, and these really stunning covers that don't have any text on the front of it, uh, these different faces of these like merfolk, these uh, underwater civilizations, and the whole game is like that. You're trying to ma- manipulate these different lords and their different faction creatures with fantastic looking artwork. The fact is, though, a, a game can have great artwork and still be terrible. Abyss is a solid, fun, family weight game, despite its sort of grim t- tone of the graphic design. Because it's just a matter of, it's just like a set collection game. Get different types of cards, use them to purchase other bigger cards, these lord cards that give you special powers and different abilities, and also give you keys, which will enable you to you collect these keys to get different domains, which gives you more points and scoring. It's a very simple game. It's abstract in a lot of ways. I don't think that there's a strong theme here, uh, really, at all. I'll totally admit that. But again... It says something when a game can surpass what would obviously be a very large stumbling block and still be very enjoyable because the gameplay is so smooth, so fun, so fast, and it looks amazing, so I have to give it major props for that. That is Abyss, my number 35. Hate Man says, great artwork, but the game is the opposite of that. There's nothing I liked. Instead, I find it extremely annoying to ask each and every player for each and every card one draws. And since you do that 80% of the time... My number 34 is an amazing deck builder called Paperback. It is down 11 spots from number 23. And I'd like to think that I'm one of the first people to jump on this game. I backed it on Kickstarter. It's just an amazing game. And since then, it's got a really big following. It's really blown up for that designer, Tim Fowers, which is a great thing. Because I hate Scrabble. Hate it. I think it's just a really dull experience. I'd rather just do a crossword puzzle on my own than deal with Scrabble. I know they're different, but whatever. Uh, That's my analogy, and I'm sticking to it. But Paperback takes the concept of Scrabble, of stringing together letters to make words to score as many points as possible, puts it into a deck-building format, and ups the ante by giving you the capability to get whatever letters you want. 
And then it's just a matter of making sure that you get them at the right time by drawing them in deck building fashion and then stringing them together into the best words possible. There's achievements that you're going for, which I always love in games. I mean, the game just works fantastically. I would say the only problem with it, although it is also one of the things that endears me to the game, is you trying to figure out how to string together these cards into words that get you the most benefit possible, which means that the game can go on a bit long because you're sitting there looking at your cards like, I know I can make something out of this, something amazing, but it's so hard to do it. We actually, and I don't know if this is cheating or not, we actually started using a Scrabble dictionary not to give ourselves ideas for words, but just to be like, is that actually a word like like you would in typical Scrabble? Because at a certain point, you're like, whatever I can get away with, I'm going to try it. And then people challenge each other and so on and so forth. But either way, even if you do it much more casually than my group of nutcases and my group does, including myself, um, it's still a fantastic game. And it looks good. It plays great. There's cooperative modes, different things like that. That is paperback, self-published by designer Tim Fowers. And I hope that it gets even more recognition. However, Clyde I, 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 Clyde the Third, says, Better than Dominion for sure, but still suffers from most of the same problems Dominion has. This is certainly a two-player only affair. Avoid four to five players at all costs. My number 33 is down 17 spots from number 16. I think it's just because of the length of this game. I can't get it to the table quite as much as I used to. But for a while there, it was my go-to heavy area control game. That is chaos in the old world. I almost wanted to move it up even further on the list just to stick it to a game that I have notoriously been critical of in the past year for ripping this game off. But chaos in the old world is one of the best asymmetrical games I've ever played. You take control of the Dark Lords of the Warhammer Fantasy Universe, the Dark Chaos Gods, who are vying for domination of that fantasy world. I don't know all the details of Warhammer Fantasy, so I don't know the names of things, but you are you have your like sort of lording over this map that looks like pooled, stretched human skin. Uh, it's a very gruesome looking game. And you are trying to put your followers out onto the board and corrupt the different areas of the board as well. The area control comes in the different corruption marks, markers that you put on each region to try to turn them into your favor. But you also put out your followers to sometimes count as corruption to uh, battle the other players as well. And it's you're trying to bring these areas to ruin and be the one to get the most points when they finally are destroyed and fall into ruin. But also you want to meet your own personal objectives. That's where the asymmetrical part comes in because certain characters, certain uh, chaos gods get ticks on their dial of achievements more based on different criteria than the other players. Korn wants to kill people. He can kill other people's units and that gets some ticks on his dials. Whereas uh, Zinch, the uh, the magician, wants to get these warp stones and have control of those regions in order to get more ticks on the dial. Or the expansion, the, the horned rat, the Skaven Lord, wants to just get as many of his rat followers on the board as possible and make uh, his points that way. So you can win the game by points. You can win it by getting as many uh, the the dial clicks as possible and get, being the first one to get your final click. It's just great, asymmetric. Every game feels different and distinct. It's long, but I think it's ultimately worth it. And there have been games that have come across with more grandiose components and have imitated Chaos in the Old World, but I still feel that this is the better implementation of the game. Another solid hit from Eric Lang. That is Chaos in the Old World, my number 33 from Fantasy Flight Games. Still very high on Board Game Geek's top 100 list as well. Farside Hobbs, however, speaks for a lot of people who are critical of this game in saying, good mechanics, but I did not like the theme at all. Rated 1 due to the theme. He is not alone if you look at those comments. My number 32 is another one of the highest ranked party games on my list. It is actually up 8 spots from number 40 because... I think leading up to the time of me putting together this list, I actually was playing it quite a bit for the first time in a while. That is the Resistance uh, Resistance or Resistance Avalon. It's really interesting. They actually came out with a third edition of the base game of the Resistance, which makes it much more almost identical mechanically to the Resistance Avalon. And since I like the sci-fi theme a bit better, I feel like I've flip-flopped and gone from liking Avalon more to the now liking the normal resistance but really even avalon was essentially the resistance if you don't like the resistance you're not going to like avalon and vice versa but any way that you slice it this is a 
uh, team deduction game. There's spies. There's good guys. The good guys need to root out the spies. They need to succeed at missions. The spies want to stay hidden. They know each other. And they want to fail missions. To me, this blows away Werewolf. The idea that people still play Werewolf when this game exists boggles my mind. Because this is... Uh, now, I understand that there are times when in, in the Resistance where it's just like, I don't know what to do. I have to vote for somebody and I have to elect somebody and nominate someone to be on the team and I don't know who the traders are. But if you're really good at the game and you play with people who are very experienced at the game, you can see breadcrumbs, you can, you know, suss out why did you do that? Why did you vote that way? Why didn't you vote for the team? Why were you on this team that succeeded but on this team that failed? Are you a good guy? Are you not? There's actual evidence in the game and things to work off of and people's ticks and facial expressions and you know all these different nuances to the game that other games like Werewolf just don't have where you're just kind of voting for people based on nothing at all, at least in the beginning. The Resistance has always worked better for my group. It's fast. It's fun. It's got lots of yelling, which isn't everybody's cup of tea, but I still enjoy it quite a bit. And a lot of the different things that the... um that Avalon and the new version of the base game of the Resistance add, like the Assassin and Merlin, and um, there's there's a couple of other expansions for the base game that make things pretty interesting, just give more flavor to the game. And I, I really like the new stuff that they add all the time. I've, I've been pretty impressed with it. So that is the Resistance, my number 32. Vapo, or Vapo, says, If I'm going to spend half an hour arguing with my friends, I want it to be over something much more interesting than whether the card in front of me is blue or not. And the last one for today, my number 31, it is actually down 18 spots from number 13, which is going to surprise people in a moment, and that is Super Dungeon Explorer. The reason why that might be surprising to people, and was even surprising to me myself, is because this year, a brand new big box standalone game expansion for Super Dungeon Explorer came out called Super Dungeon Explorer The Forgotten King. This was a huge game from Kickstarter. I was incredibly happy to get it, and I'm very, very happy with it and pleased with the content in the box. So why did the game fall down that much? much this is simply a matter of super dungeon explorer is one of the longest games in my collection it's one of the most elaborate games in my collection it's very uh tough to set it up it's very tough to teach and it's just a game i cannot get to the table very often and at times uh i think i played it uh, yeah, i played the forgotten king when it first came out maybe like four or five times and since then i've not really touched it other than buying more expansions for it and sometimes i feel like i'm collecting the game more than playing it but there is a solid game there a one versus all game or now fully cooperative game which doesn't quite work as well as the one versus all mode but it's essentially gauntlet the game you and the other players take control of these cute chibi fantasy warriors banding together to go through a dungeon run by a overlord called the console who is trying to set up these spawn points and have flood the board with as many enemies as possible to take out the heroes until eventually the big boss shows up and there's a final showdown. It's got fantastic miniatures. The new sets have better tiles and more status effects and things like that. There's the new arcade mode, which is fully cooperative if you want to play that way. Um, and I love all of the new characters. And there's more and more and more content. They just had another huge Kickstarter for more content, which I unashamedly <laughs> backed into, despite not playing the game that much. Although the new game is going to have a campaign mode, which is still really difficult for me to get to the table. But I can't help it. I have a huge soft spot for Super Dungeon Explorer. I think it's just a fantastic idea. And I love chibi anime characters. And at least there is a fantastic game to back up that theme. So that is Super Dungeon Explorer. My number 31, Burnham says one good thing quote unquote i can say about this game it makes me appreciate some other dungeon crawlers that much more edit the tenth of a point is because i like this better than a game of thrones which is very interesting so that is the end of this segment of the list number 40 through number 31 we're getting so close to my top 10 i'm very excited to share that with people and uh, excited for the rest of the games that are co to come up as well. You will be seeing those as quickly as I can put them out. For now, that is the Top 100 Games 2015 edition. Thank you so much for joining us, and stay tuned. Take care.